Well, it's new stuff day, except we don't actually have CPUs. Oops, that was almost bad. How's it going? <laughs> Are we live? Is it actually working? The thing actually doing stuff? Should, uh, if I would plan these things a little bit better, we could have like a cool overlay where like I'm not talking and you know, you could see stuff's going on in the background and that kind of thing. There's chat right there. There's chat. So Z390 launched today. It's a new Intel chipset, eight core CPUs. What else is going on? Well, they're soldered. That's sort of top of the headline for me. A Z390 also incorporates uh, USB 3.1 Gen 2 internally to the chipset. So, you know, with the Z370, there was an external chipset for the USB 3.1 Gen 2. And then there was like H370, which included two USB 3.1 Gen 2 sort of on board. And now we have Z390, which is an updated chipset that brings on board USB 3.1 Gen 2, 10 gigabit USB. So, yeah, it's exciting. There's new stuff. Because look, the 2080 Ti, keeping that thing fed and all this kind of stuff. So the, the bottom line is that today's sort of a weird day. The motherboards are no longer under embargo, but you can't talk about the performance of the new CPUs. And so I don't have one. I do not have an eight core CPU. I don't have anything. All I've got is the Intel press release. And we can take a look at the Intel, the Intel press release. I've got that in the, in the thing over here somewhere. Uh, maybe, possibly, Ooh, I can, I can try to pull it up and we can look at that together. We can go through the Intel press release and see what's going on. I've got the Meg Z390 Ace motherboard and the Z390 Tai Chi. Uh, the bad news is that these things are probably going to be pretty expensive. I mean, Intel's already released the pricing. It's like $500 for the i9, the eight core 16 thread, but the i7 is eight core eight thread. So yeah, they did away with hyper threading on the, uh, you know, on the i7. And that is actually a not, there's, there is probably a technical reason for that. And it's not, it's not as arbitrary as you might think. And it, again, I don't have a CPU, just guessing here, but um, there's some links in the description of the, uh, of the, uh, of the video. And so we're going to sort of go through those together and sort of talk about the Intel press release and some of the other stuff that's there. There's also links to Anatech and Tom's Hardware because they've, they've done a lot more in-depth stuff there. And there's also a link to an MSI live stream for their new motherboards. Now MSI is actually coming out with like a zillion new boards. Uh, ASRock is coming out with a zillion new boards as is Asus and Gigabyte. Uh, I've got some, some more information on this that's going to come out later. Can't talk about it yet, but stuff is happening we're gonna we're gonna be doing a thing later in the month it's gonna be exciting with the new eight core uh intel cpu releases and that kind of thing and i will hang out with you guys in chat in just a minute but i figured that we could go through the intel newsroom thing first and i can sort of help translate the uh the press release if you will so let me see if i can yeah look at that that worked correctly Woo, it's like a live episode of the news. Intel announces the world's best gaming processor, the new 9th gen Intel Core i9-9900K. Woo. Uh, they're also talking about the Xeon W stuff, the new, like the 28 core monster, which is a Xeon, and then the 18 core stuff. Uh, Basin Falls, whoops. We will come back to that. We will, we will talk about the cool higher end stuff from the press release, which again, I have no inside knowledge of at all. I, I know nothing. I know nothing, Jon Snow. I don't know. Game of Thrones, whatever. And look, we're going to do an overhead. Oh, no. <laughs> the hot jar has literally exploded with, uh, with awesomeness. And so we've got this overhead view thing that we're going to do. But uh, for right now, not so much. Let's get back to that press release. Okay. Oops, that's not the press release. That's the press release. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Turbo Boost 3, 220 FPS. All right, so let's take a look at this first claim. 220 FPS on three of the most four, three of the four most popular global game PC titles, whatever. This is platform latency. And this is one area um, where AMD has got to do a little bit more work. It's really the high frame rate gaming. When you're talking about 4K gaming, 
the graphics card really becomes the bottleneck. It's a game of latencies. So uh, if we play a game where I throw something at you and you throw something at, be at me back to me as fast as you possibly can, uh, it, we could do it so fast that it gets to the, a point where like the physical motion of us throwing it is like the bottleneck of how many times per second you can do that. And so when we're talking about 1080p gaming, the graphics card spends so little time processing that frame that it's really, it's like, okay, I'm done with that, that data, send me the next batch of data. Okay, I'm done with that data, send me the next batch of data. Literally telling the processor that it's ready for the next batch of data, that round trip latency between the processor and the graphics card, that becomes your bottleneck. That becomes your, your limiting factor. And so on, um, on the AMD's platform, there's more bandwidth, but the latency is higher. And so it can make half as many trips to move the same amount of data, but in terms of like round trip time, the latency is a little bit higher. And so when you look at games like GTA 5, when we've done our testing with GTA 5, even on the prior platforms, the GTA 5 engine breaks at like 140 FPS, but when you look at games like GTA 5, the bottleneck is that sort of round trip latency. And so what they're talking about with this initial claim is really the overall platform latency that is better on Intel. And we have no reason to believe that, that that would not be the case because that is literally, I mean, this is, we're just talking about an eight core. It's the same thing. It's almost the same chipset. They've added USB through three, but you can actually use the new eight core CPUs on Z370, especially if you've got a nice Z370 motherboard that can do with the power delivery. So if you've got a good Z370 motherboard, you could literally just get a new CPU and drop it in. But the new chipset will give you some better USB features and that kind of thing. But um, and the motherboards might be a little bit better built in terms of power delivery, especially for overclocking, because five gigahertz across eight cores, it's gonna use a lot of power. So, yeah, let's look at that. Okay, so Adobe Premiere up to 34% faster video editing. Eh, take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. I'm guessing, again, I don't have any inside knowledge. Overclock these new processors with the extreme, the extreme Tuning Utility. Extreme Tuning Utility actually is a pretty good stand-in for situations where the motherboard uh, BIOS maybe is not the best for overclocking so you can use XTU and have full control over everything so motherboard UEFI's matter a little bit less than they used to in prior generations with the advent of tools like XTU. Now XTU's been around for a long time not really a big deal so uh, let's see what else we got you know ninth gen 40% uh, overclock da -da -da. Z390 chipset okay uh, there's some cool slides here, ultimate overclock. Okay, so this is the, the new processors. We'll come back to those at the end of this. And so these are like the really high end. These are, these are glorified Xeons, basically. 1979 for 1836 core, 4.4 gigahertz. You know, Turbo Boost 2, 4.5. Eh, wow, I mean, you know, uh, we'll come back to that. There was one slide here that talks about platform PCI Express lanes. And I want to be clear so that you guys understand the PCIe lanes. Um, the PCIe lanes with this are, uh, they're, you get 16 CPU, basically these socket 1151 CPUs are 20 PCI Express lanes. 16 for the graphics card and four for the DMI 3.0 interface. So when you look at these motherboards and it says that you have 24 PCI Express 3 lanes from the chipset, all of those PCI Express lanes go through the DMI interface. So if you're going to run like SLI with higher end graphics cards and M.2 RAID, the M.2 is going to bottleneck because it goes through the DMI. Honestly, I'm not sure that I would run SLI on this. I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe, I mean, the 2080 Ti, this is a monster of a card. I can talk about this. This is not under embargo. We just got ours on Friday. I've been doing testing, working on a video on it. This card is a monster. It uses a lot of bandwidth. It is crazy expensive. It's definitely not for casual gaming. This is for like, you know, the, this is, this is, it's like, I've been working in the field as a programmer for two years now. I've got a pretty good salary and some disposable income. I'm going to buy a nice gaming rig. That's 4K, sort of insane. I don't know if running that at PCI Express 3 by 8 that you may actually have some reduced performance for that. Don't know yet. Don't quote me on that. Still got to test it. So by 8 by 8 plus an M.2 RAID, 
that may not be an ideal situation. On Z390, you're still going to run, want to run a single M.2. M.2 RAID is not going to make a lot of sense. You could theoretically run M.2 RAID off of eight of your PCI Express lanes from the CPU and leave eight for the GPU, but again, bottleneck. Uh, don't quote me on that. So, that said, uh, eight cores, soldered. I mentioned that before. Uh, some other stuff from the press release. So, uh, and we're doing this as a live stream because there's not really a lot here that, uh, I mean, there's, it's really just press release stuff and the unboxing of motherboards. So, I've got to stop doing that. So, yeah, uh, should be good. All right, what did I miss? I can hang out with the chat now. How is it going, chat? How are you guys doing? WC Kern, thank you for $2. How will this stack up against Ryzen 2 and Threadripper? Well, Threadripper is more cores, but it has a higher platform latency. For higher resolution gaming, like 4K gaming, I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference. Honestly, the eight cores, what's most beneficial right now with the current crop of games that we have, I would guess, is streaming. Like, you've got extra CPU overhead for streaming because six cores is kind of a thing. Really, it's the four core people. So, like, four cores with, like, a graphics card like this, I don't, it's, again, preliminary testing, not really all the way through it yet. Depends on the game. If you really spend a lot of time maybe minimizing the stuff that's going on in the background of your system, if you're a four core user, you might be okay. But I think it's going to be like six cores on up. So just my own my own personal opinion there. And Peter Ruxter, DKK20, thank you. Here, take my money. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, good live stream. Woo. All right. Questions. Why is your forum... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, come hang out. I mean, it's not, it's not, they grow on you. It's fine. <laughs> oh, how's it going? Jason, you know, hi everybody. Four cores and a 1080. Yeah, four cores and a 1080 is fine. Uh, <laughs> who still buys four core CPUs? Used CPUs are, are a pretty good deal. Okay, let's, let's, uh, Want to buy 3,200 2x16 gigs of ECC RAM. So you can build it yourself. Samsung has, uh, is it 3,200? I think it's, no, 2,933. Samsung has 2,933 chips from the factory. Like they're making chips that are 2,933. You can solder your own RAM on the reference PCB, but it's not being mass produced. Paul Spencer, how hot do we think this will get? Insanely hot. So hot that Intel had to solder it. You know, at Computex, so I had an inside source that said that they were considering, maybe, and I could not corroborate this, the 8086K, you remember that, the anniversary edition? So my source said that they were experimenting with soldering the 8086K to make the overclocks a little bit better. Well, it turns out with the 8086K, it's pretty easy to hit 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, even with the thermal interface material that's not solder. So they did not end up soldering the 8086K, it uses thermal paste. But, lo and behold, here we are. It, Intel has confirmed that they are soldering the new CPUs, the new, the new monster CPUs. There are three. Let's let's take, let's now that everybody's here, let's talk about that. Three CPUs, and I think that was in the the Intel press release. So let's go back to that for a second because I sort of glossed over that table. I think. Um, yeah. All right. So here's the table. The i9 9900K, 3.6 gigahertz base clock. Intel Turbo Boost 2.0, maximum single core turbo, 5 gigahertz, 8 cores, 16 threads, TDP of 95 watts. It's, it's, it's not, no. Uh, <laughs> 16 megs of cache it is unlocked, up to 40 PCI Express lanes. Again, okay, yeah, that's what I, I got off on a tangent of the 40 PCI Express lanes. It's 16 plus 4, it's just the, the plus 4 comes with a MUX that will let you run a bunch. So you have 16 plus 4 PCI Express lanes worth of bandwidth across the platform. It's just that those four, it's like a PLX bridge, but you're never going to get more than, the DMI 3.0 is never going to be more than 4 gigabytes per second, period. Count on it. Two channels of DDR4 2666, again overclockable because we've already, G-Skill has already announced DDR4 4800. I've got a G-Skill... Uh, 4,000, DDR4 4,000 kit. You better believe we're going to be testing that. 488 US dollars! 
Does Intel think I'm made of US dollars? Blah. Then we've got the i7 9700K, 3.6 gigahertz base clock, 4.9, uh, 4.9 maximum single core turbo, which, I mean, come on, come on. Eight cores and eight threads. Ooh, that's interesting in an i7. Uh, 12 megs of cache, even though it's eight cores. And yes, it's unlocked and up to 40 and two channels, blah, blah, blah. Everything else is the same. 374. So this is a little more expensive than the six core, uh, the six core 8700K, 80, uh, but 4.9 max. They should have done five. I mean, come on. Um, eight cores, eight threads. So no hyper threading. Okay. So here is, and again, I don't have a CPU. This is a guess. This is a prediction. I think the reason that they, it's not really segmentation. Like part of this is segmentation because Intel loves to segment the market. But there is a technical reason that it makes sense not to run the uh, the 9700K with hyper-threading in eight cores. And that is the socket 1151, it's kind of hard to keep all eight of those cores fed, I'm guessing. And the reason that I say that is because certain types of workloads that were really good at working with hyper-threading on the 8700K, I noticed a slight dip in performance. Which, which suggested that, a, that 12 threads on the 8700K for certain types of workloads that where hyper-threading works really well meant that the rest of the system could not keep that CPU fed. There just wasn't enough memory bandwidth or PCI Express bandwidth or whatever it was for the particular workload to keep the CPU fed. So with eight cores and eight threads, I think that Intel is in a better position to keep the real cores fed as opposed to having real cores fighting with uh, hyper-threaded cores that are probably not managed by the operating system correctly. So like if we look at how badly Windows has managed a lot of threads on other processors, I think it's pretty easy to conclude that you know when you've got real cores and hyper-threaded cores in the mix that it's there and you've got some sort of resource contention starvation problem it's probably exacerbated by the fact that you've got hyper-threading in the mix. So the i I don't know we we got to I mean you got hyper threading on the i9 so I might be wrong we need to test it but the i9 also has more cache and so more cache means that you've got less trips to memory uh, to actually have to like worry about that and deal with that so maybe it doesn't matter maybe this is a market segmentation thing I'm really not sure but you should keep in mind that a hyper threaded core is really only worth about you know 10 to 25 percent best case scenario of a real core. So on the six core, if the six core you disable hyper-threading, it's like losing about one virtual core, maybe. I mean, depending on how you swing. I mean, not really. There's, I'm really making, I'm really oversimplifying. But I really think that the 1151 platform wasn't really designed for eight cores. And this is just Intel saying, okay, well, we're gonna do eight cores and you know soldered cooling and all this kind of stuff. So that's just my own my own two cents. So, uh, oh, thank you, Peter for another DKK50. What do you think about upgrading X299 from six core to eight core, 10 core with the new platform coming out? Also, any news on PCIe lanes, tiers on the new SKU of high-end desktop chips? Uh, there, we'll talk about the high-end desktop, desktop chips in a little bit. Um, X299, you know, the prices on the uh, 5000 series, because I had an X99, uh, six core system and it was like oh I hope the eight core CPU prices come down they never did so I mean if you can get a used CPU on eBay maybe that would make sense but honestly like eight cores even ten cores I don't think even ten cores make sense uh, especially on like X299 I've got a 7900X that thing did not hold its value at all like all of this new core stuff it's like I paid a thousand dollars for the 7900X it, it really has not held its value in the advent of, you know, eight core mainstream desktop systems from Intel at this clock speed, my own personal opinion, because the 7900X I have has trouble maintaining four and a half gigahertz uh, on all cores, which is a substantial overclock for that CPU. But in this day and age, three gigahertz feels a little anemic for only 10 cores. Again, my personal opinion. So, uh, okay, let's unbox. What do you say? Uh, 
Uh, nope, wrong window. There we go. Look at that. Did I break my background monitors? No, why do you say that? It's because it's glitching? Let's see. Oh yeah, we can't look at that yet. That's not something we can see yet. Yeah, mm, unboxing. Need some need some nice music here, don't we? What about Spectre and Meltdown? There's no Spectre and Meltdown mitigations in hardware. Uh, well, the Spectre and Meltdown mitigations that are in hardware come in the form of launch day microcode. So the launch day microcode has the Spectre and Meltdown mitigations. Uh, and so there, there might be some minor, minor revisions in silicon, but by and large, not really a lot of uh, mitigations for all the new variants in silicon, but you can expect launch day microcode will have all the mitigations up through up through now. So nice. So this is the MSI Meg. This is a really uh, this is designed to be a really high end board for the. Um, uh, for the new CPUs, the new eight cores. It's got two eight pin CPU power connectors from what I can tell. It's got the, you know, digital, like the Corsair digital header, I believe. Yeah. It's got the Corsair digital header on top. So if you want to use Corsair accessories, you get two USB 3.1 Gen 2 type C connections. You get the right angle connection. You get the, the knob where you can turn it up to 11, which is pretty awesome. You get three physical by 16 slots. And then we've got a lot of uh, PLX switches here and also our M.2 here. We're going to have to check the manual and see what the breakdown is because I'm noticing these uh, these other PCIe switches and I'm wondering if the PCIe switches switch between slot and, and interface here or if MSI has anticipated the, uh, the DMI bottleneck and will allow us to run it by 8 plus something for the thing. I'm not really sure but we'll take a look at that. So here's our M.2 Shield, here's another front panel USB 3 header, USB 2 headers, fan connectors, you can do the overclock thing. So it's a pretty nice looking board. This is a, an RGB sort of Hall of Mirrors effect thing. Uh, again, no CPUs. Uh, you can run an 8th gen CPU in this, so I will be setting up an 8th gen CPU in this to test and show off and, and do stuff. On the back of the motherboard, these little guys are, if you get a case that uh, has the standoffs pre-installed, uh, you don't have to worry about taking them out. So like some motherboards have a hole here, so there's two holes. And this motherboard does not have a hole, but if you have a standoff here and you don't have this protection on the PCB, you could accidentally short something out. So technically you're supposed to take out standoffs in your case that the motherboard does not use. And so it's the same deal over here. Depending on what standoffs are pre-installed in your case, uh, you might accidentally short something out. And so they've added these to try to protect people that have no idea how to build a computer and accidentally leave a standoff in there. Don't leave a standoffs in there. That's crazy. So, so there's that. So also in the box, we've got our high speed bridge, which is useless in the advent of, <laughs> oops, it's not in there because it's in the yard. Yeah, so, but this is nice if you got a 10 series card. Our installation DVD, case badge, more other stuff, paperwork. Anybody want to cable mods? No, that's not what that is. That's a thank you thing. Some labels, M.2 screws, a lot of M.2 screws. Quick installation guide. I'm going to put all that back over on one side. Yes. Now, this is how you do. This is how you do Wi-Fi antennas. So it has built-in Wi-Fi. This is how you do Wi-Fi antennas. You don't do the little rubber duck things. You do a nice external antenna. We've got a plurality of SATA cables and then a ton of RGB cables in the box. So if you're doing an RGB build, whether you're using 50-50 strips or the digital or the Corsair header, motherboard's got you covered. So we're going to put all that back in. Unless anybody wants to see anything in particular in the chat. 
Woo! Uh, Brzezorn, DKK50, which one of the two will attempt to launch a new instruction set, or will x86 prevail for a long time? It'll probably be x86 for a long time, in all honesty. Uh, by the way, what are those background monitors? They are LG, um, the LG, uh, like, 50-inch TVs or whatever. They're just monitors. WC Kern, is the knob supposed to be used as a thermostat? The top is for overclocking, so it has 11 positions, and depending on how much of an overclock you want, you just use the knob, and it's a bunch of presets for overclocking. So when you're overclocking, you can literally just, uh, you know, set the, you know, set the overclock, and you're good to go. Hey, where's the manual? Ah, yeah, okay. So here's the manual. So this is like the most boring stream ever. It's like some dude's reading a manual. But yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Uh, I always look for the chipset diagram to see if there's like a block diagram for how bandwidth breaks down in the system because that gives us a clue about where things go. Okay, so Z390, Optane Ready. Um, let's see. Uh, RAID 1, RAID 5, Z390 chipset, USB audio, memory. Memory supports DDR4, 4500, OC, 4400, 4300, 4, uh, 4, all the way down to 2133. So DDR4, 4500 tested and confirmed working on this motherboard. It's nothing to sneeze at. That's a lot. And it supports up to 64 gigs of memory. So 16 gigs per stick, at least as of right now. M.2 and SATA share bandwidth. Uh, M.2 number one is PCIe 3. Okay, and then it's, of course, Optane Ready. Doesn't say anything about how the bandwidth breaks down on this page. Uh, back panel, internal connectors, internal buttons, jumpers, diagnostic LEDs. It's got four easy debug LED headers. It's 128 megabit flash, UEFI, SMBOS 2.8, ACPI 6.1. It's got Mystic Light, that's MSI's thing which is pretty cool I mean you can you can hook it up to even to like room lighting and have the lighting change depending on what uh, what, what's going on in game and stuff which is a lot of fun um, special features multi GPU crossfire core boost game boost lightning USB turbo USB 3.1 gen 2 USB with type AC BIOS click BIOS BIOS flashback so you can flash it even with no CPU aha a block diagram yes check it out this is Probably blurry for you guys. There's the block diagram. Look at that. That's what we want. Okay, our M.2s. Uh, yep, nope. Hmm. Well, the diagram shows that there's a switch with up to three graphics cards, but. Uh, Hmm, I'm not sure. Two channel memory. Our M.2s are all through the chipset though, which means that they will bottleneck on this DMI 3.0 interface. So if you wanted to run a RAID 1 with like two of the Samsung drives, it will bottleneck on this uh, DMI 3.0 interface. But this, this is promising. Maybe the bottom slot is a switch since it has three, but I don't know. I, that would, it would be by eight by four by four if that were the case. Although if that were the case, by eight by four by four, you would have the option of uh, running a PCI Express M.2 add-in card, and then that plus the DMI would not bottleneck if that is the case. But the bottom slot is usually serviced by the DMI anyway. PCIe E6. So PCIe one through six is just a PCIe expansion slot. That's not super useful. The only way to figure this out is to put it on the test bit. Oh, okay, here we go. Yeah, okay, single by 16, two-way by by eight, three-way by 16 by eight by eight, what? Okay, by eight, by one, by eight, by 16, by one, by one, nothing, nothing. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, check it out, look. It does actually work that way, by eight, by four, by four. So this is pretty cool. So this motherboard 
according to the manual, I gotta test this to be sure, will run this slot in by eight and this slot in by eight, this one by nothing, or by eight by four by four. So if you wanted to do M.2 RAID, you could use one M.2 off of the chipset and one as a PCI Express add-in card and you would not bottleneck, but your graphics card will be running it by eight and then you've got by four here for another peripheral. If you wanted to run SLI and M.2 RAID, you have to use two M.2 slots through the chipset, which doesn't actually really benefit you. So not something I would recommend. But you've got the option of by eight, by four, by four, which is a pretty cool feature for a motherboard, and that explains this other set of PCI Express bridges. So that's pretty fun. Are they using a PLX? No, it's not a PLX. It is... PC, literal PCI Express switches. So if they're using a PLX, you could do by eight by eight by four and just, you know, the PLX will let you aggregate the traffic together while keeping the same number of lanes. And then as long as all the devices are not using more bandwidth than that, then that would work. But these are, these are just switches. So it's everything here for 16, these two slots are dead or by eight by eight, this bottom slot is dead or, uh, by eight by four by four and that's that's these these switches do that type of switching whereas plx would let you share the bandwidth if that makes sense and i think the higher end i think the godlike uh is using uh plx bridges i think i think i saw that but it was just announced i don't have all the details but that's sort of where we are anybody have any questions about that Oh, and it's got a built-in IO shield. This is becoming standard, like having, uh, not really standard, but standard on higher end boards. And I have to say that I kind of like that. I mean, check out our interface here. We've got, uh, let me put it down a little bit so maybe it's more in focus. We've got our USB, USB 3.1 Gen 2, uh, network interface. Oh, I didn't check what kind of NIC are we dealing with here, but it's a killer NIC. Let's just take a look. Killer 2500, I'm guessing. I guessed. Let's find out if I guessed wrong. Storage, RAID, wireless LAN, and Bluetooth. Intel Wireless AC 9560 supports 802.11 ABGN AC MU MIMO 2.4 and 5 gigahertz up to 1.73 gigabit. Bluetooth 2, 2.1, EDR 3, 4.0, and 5. Uh, doesn't say, oh yeah, Killer Nick is a E2500, so I guessed correctly. It's an E2500. Killer Nick. So yeah, any questions about the MSI before before I put it away? It looks like a pretty pretty ridiculous, pretty high-end board, probably with a price to boot. Did I miss anybody in the chat? Uh, how's it going? Good job. Stuff's happening. Nope. I, have, I haven't missed anything since the thermostat question. Woo! Okay. So, USB-C. It's got two USB-C front panel headers and one on the back. You do have a triple slot for the graphics card. So two triples, that's an option. <laughs> the PLX chip most of the time are in the upper part of the board, not those three chips near the X16 slot. What are you even saying? Look. This, there's no PLX. These are just PCI Express switches. These are like as media. I don't think I can, uh, I kind of want to get like super close, tweet you a picture of that. These are just as media PCI Express switches. It's literally, a, a PLX is like a multiplexer. Like you can have two conversations going at the same time. These PLX switches will literally disconnect wires in this slot and hook them up in this other slot. They're, they're different things. Yeah, so 
Okay, that is, that is enough. That is the MSI Meg Z390 Ace. And by the way, Meg is like a new, uh, from MSI, Meg is like a new family of boards. So like you guys may have seen the Threadripper Meg board. And there's, I think there's also the Meg Z390 Godlike, which is an even higher end board than this. And um, the, that is the, the, the sort of the higher end family of boards that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that MSI are doing these days. And so like the stuff that they advertise in the back is, you know, pre-installed IO shielding, Mystic Light. It's got an ESS Saber audio DAC. Uh, there's really, there's kind of a lot going on here. You can, you can see that RGB Hall of Mirrors thing that I was talking about before. Um, you know, so we got eight USB, you know, type A ports, nine actually, is that nine? Yeah, nine USB type A ports, one USB-C, the, and then optical SPDIF out. And the, uh, the audio interface, it's, you know, it's ESS Saver stuff. Triple M.2 does have three M.2 slots, although all three of them are going through the chipset. So I would use the PCI Express add-in if I were going to build an M.2 RAID with this. Well, let's put that to the test. I think I've got enough parts to do that. Would you guys like to see that? Would you guys like to see the M.2 RAID? I... Uh, I kind of would like to see how the Z3, the 8 core, if I can get my hands on a 90, 9900K, I'd kind of like to see how the RAID on that stacks up. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll end up eating my words. I don't know. But the 2080 Ti plus on PCI Express by 8 plus, you know, M.2 RAID, four through the DMI, four lanes through the DMI, four lanes through the chipset. I don't know. But, you know, seven gigabytes per second read and five and a half, six gigabytes per second write. That, that might be pretty insane. So yeah, definitely upvote and share if you want to see the uh, the raid thing going on. So yeah, so that's the MSI Mag Z390 Ace. We've also got the Azrock Tai Chi. The thing that I like about Azrock is they usually like the Tai Chi is like they try to find the balance. Not the most expensive thing in the world, but not the cheapest. So Z390 is built for the eight core, eight eight core, eight thread, and eight core. 16 thread and the power delivery and all the stuff that goes with that so yeah so it's got three m.2s it's got an m.2 heat sink it's got intel wi-fi 802.11 ac pcie slots this is usb 3.1 gen 2 type c uh for the front uh, polychrome rgb so you've got the digital addressable header and two rgb 50 50 headers this is purity sound 4 hyper b clock 2 engine so an external base clock generator Super alloy capacitors. That's all the stuff they advertise in the box. Let's open it. There we go. Yeah, look at that. There's the Tai Chi. It won't open. There it goes. Is that right? Yeah. Woo! Manual. Oh, wow, that's a that's a hefty manual. Is it multi-language? Oh, it's so hefty because it's multi-language. All right. All right, all right. Let's play the game. Let's play the game. The game is played. Check the PCI Express thingy. Oh, there's some motorcycles outside because it's springtime. It's springtime. Spring is in the air. I mean, not spring. It's fall. What am I saying? Live streams. Not good at them. Kind of retarded. Sorry. Um, DDR4 4200 plus OC. 4133, 4038, 66, 6, etc. Uh, up to 64 gigs. XMP profile 2.0. Three PCI Express slots. So that'll be by 16, by 8, by 8, or triple at by 8. Uh, or no, wait. It says... Triple at by eight by four by four. Ooh, so that's promising. Oh, there's a star, and the star says supports NVMe SSD as boot disks. So in PCIe 5, you could run uh, an M.2, which is what I was proposing before. Two PCI Express 3.0 by one slot, flexible PCIe. Those are going to go through the chipset. Let's see if we've got a diagram. So this is a Realtek ALC 1220 codec, audio, Nishikon fine gold audio capacitors, NE5532 headset amplifier for up to 600 ohm headsets, uh, two Intel gigabit NICs, one I219V and one I211AT, 
So dual gigabit mix, it does, it can do teaming on Windows 10, Redstone 2 and above, Intel Wi-Fi, AB, GN, AC. So I saw somebody in the chat calling for Intel onboard mix. Well, there you go. Uh, three USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type A, one USB 3.1 Type C, uh, four USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports from the Z390 chipset, clear CMOS button, storage. Uh, storage supports the U.2, the M.2 storage supports the U.2 kit and the NVMe SSDs as well as Optane drives, so that's good. Nothing untoward there. So let's look at this. Uh, block diagram. Where is my block diagram? This motherboard. Manual might not have. Oh, uh, I think I think we rolled the rolled the dice and lost on the motherboard block diagram. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe if somebody's super bored in the chat, they could go try to find a. Uh, they could go try to find the motherboard block diagram. But let's just continue with the unboxing, shall we? Get the Azrock Tai Chi postcard, so you can send your friends a postcard. And be like, hey, I, I got this motherboard and you don't. Are you jealous? <laughs> The installation driver CD, and this is the software suite package. Azrock always does the software part separately, so they explain sort of how the software works and, and the options in a UEFI, which is, it's just, I mean, if you're just if you're just getting started, there's some good information in here. It's got an IO shield, so no built-in IO shield. Got the rubber duck antennas. I don't, so these antennas just screw into the back of the case. I don't particularly like this type of antenna because if your case is like shoved under your desk, it's really hard to uh, make sure that you, you know, are getting appropriate Wi-Fi signal. If you can move the, the antenna around, that's better. Got four SATA cables, some M.2 accoutrement, a high-speed bridge for 10 series cards, pretty sure, because I, I need, you know, it's funny, I actually need an NV-Link, yeah, no, this is not, this is not NV-Link, this is for 10 series cards. More M.2 accoutrement. Here's the board. Oh, I gotta set that thing there. There we are. There is the board. Now, if the manual is to be believed, I'm gonna do formal testing on this in the motherboard review, so be sure to check it out. This can be by 16, by nothing, by nothing, or by 16, by eight, by eight, or no, I'm sorry, by eight, by eight, nothing, or by eight by four by four and so these three slots go to the cpu and these two pci express by one slots go to the chipset the three ultra m.2 one here and two here go through the chipset to the cpu through the dmi interface this is actually kind of a big deal like this is actually this is different most of the motherboards for the z370 use the DMI lanes. This is, this is really crucial. There's a, there's a story being told here. So if we see this pattern on other Z390 motherboards where they're splitting up the PCI Express lanes like this, then we know that the board engineers agree with me, finally, that it's crazy to route all of this PCI Express connectivity through the chipset. I mean, it works great if you're working with low speed or relatively low speed peripherals because you've got a whole bunch of PCI Express uh, you know, devices and you can send them through the chipset and most of those devices aren't really using the full PCI Express 3.0 speed. So it doesn't really matter if you've got an interface for 20 PCI Express lanes through the chipset. But we're in an age where a single M.2 drive will saturate a PCI Express 3.0 by four uh, interface. So like if you've you got a high-end Samsung NVMe SSD, it's gonna use the full close to it, four gigabytes per second, like three and a half. And the write speed's like two point something. And so if you have two of those in RAID zero, and they're both operating at the same speed, they're gonna bottleneck because that's about eight gigabytes per second of bandwidth. If you have a really high speed capture card, like the, the 4K capture card that we're using in this machine, it's PCI Express 3.0 by four, you can't really use it through the DMI interface and have it write to an SSD because it's the, the contention between the two devices trying to talk to one another 
um, doesn't really work out because it still has to go through the CPU. It's not as if the chipset can can say, okay, we're going to take the, the raw stream from the capture card and write it directly to the SSD and it doesn't touch the CPU. That would be neat, but it, it doesn't work that way. And so the, the board designers are, are doing are jumping through hoops here in order to be able to connect these three slots to the CPU tells me that that uh, they're clued into the fact that a lot of peripherals are actually really high speed these days. And so that is a major design change from Z390 to Z370. Because on the Z370 board, they could do that on Z370 boards. But most Z370 boards, this bottom slot would actually be through the chipset and not through the CPU. So, um, Cell processing, $5. Hello, Wendell and the rest of Level 1 Tech. Thank you, cell processing. Totally don't have to do that, but thank you. That's, that's amazing. So, yeah. Any questions about how that works? So the rear I.O., we've got our wireless interface, our combo PS2 mouse and keyboard. Oh, that's nice for me. I've got a Model M. I've got DisplayPort and HDMI. We've got two, four, six, seven USB 3.0, 3.1, 3.1 Gen 2 ports at the back, one Type-C or two Intel NICs. Our Realtek, ADA, uh, Realtek ALC1220 based audio codec with optical SPDIF, and it's got the uh, the Purity Sound implementation. So we've got you know fine gold audio capacitors and uh, not much of an audio file. So it's an ALC1220 based codec with hopefully reasonable operational amplifiers, and that's pretty much it. You got the diagnostic LED readout. You've got eight USB uh, headers. You've got two USB 3.0 headers. One USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type C header for the front here. So two or four, two headers, four USB, three headers for the front total. And then we've got, looks, looks like one USB 2.0 header at the bottom or is it serial? Yeah, it's one USB header at the bottom. And then we've got our front panel interface. Thunderbolt header. Ooh, that's interesting. Is that Thunderbolt? Is that actually Thunderbolt? Yeah, okay. This is interesting. The Thunderbolt header. Thunderbolt in all other motherboard implementations that I've seen, goes through the chipset, not directly into the CPU, because it turns out hot plug directly into the CPU is tricky to do. So that there's a Thunderbolt header on here. I really want to go grab my Thunderbolt card right now and try it with this interface, because this is a direct CPU interface. According to the manual, be sure to watch our full motherboard review to find out for sure, but if this slot is actually a direct interface to the CPU and this Thunderbolt header works as advertised, it will not bottleneck through the DMI if you happen to be using multiple Thunderbolt devices or Thunderbolt plus, you know, high-speed NVMe or Thunderbolt plus high-speed NVMe and a capture device and that kind of thing. But any of this is going to eat away PCI Express lanes for your graphics cards. And we finally are starting to get graphics cards where there is a little bit of a performance difference between by 16 and by 8. Ta-da. <laughs> Nick Warren, $5, says... We don't have to, but we want to, so. Woo! Thank you all. I think that's, how long have we been streaming? 48 minutes, uh, about 10 minutes left to go. What, what questions, you guys have probably all seen a lot of the Z390 coverage. What questions do you have about the Z390 coverage? And we'll go, we'll talk about the high-end desktop parts if you want a little bit. I don't have any inside knowledge other than the, the stuff that's been published. But we can talk a little bit about the, the high-end desktop parts and sort of the uphill battle that is sort of being faced there. So, if nobody has any questions. And it is time for some Nestle Pure Life water because, goodness gracious, I'm, I'm a talker. Has the VRM already been covered? No, the VRM is in fact covered up, so I can't look at it. But I'm given to understand that the VRM on both of these are designed for the uh, the dark timeline <laughs> future in terms of like Intel power consumption. So for both of these boards, the VRM implementation is designed for five gigahertz plus power draw on all eight cores, even with hyper threading. So this particular board has one eight pin and one four pin which is uh, up to 600 watts through the connections, but you know, a single, a single eight pin can do 400 watts max, like 380 safely. 
And so this thing is not going to consume anywhere near 380 watts. I would say that it, with the most ridiculous overclock, it's still only going to be like 250, 275 watts, give or take. So one 8-pin connector is still plenty, in my opinion. Now, if you want to talk about supplying power for the rest of the system, like a bunch of graphics cards, then yeah, it makes sense to have more connectors. <laughs> DJE says, we enjoyed the talker, Wendell. Uh, I, I, I don't like it. It's just, uh, I, don't, I don't like talking. So, I mean, I guess we could take it apart and take a look at it. Just got to do the other stuff. Two pounds of super micro hack chip, hack chip story. Totally fake. It's possible that it's true. There's more to the story than that. And it's honestly not super unusual. We're going to cover that in the news. So be sure to tune in at midnight for the level one news. So, yeah. Should be exciting. Okay. High-end desktop. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk high-end desktop. Um, where's my Intel? Yeah, okay. So the, the last part of this announcement... There we go. The last part of this announcement is this. The high-end Basin Falls. You know, 3 gigahertz, 4.4, 1836 cores, $2,000. Honestly, I was expecting this to be $2,500, but $2,000, 1836, you know, 9980XE. And so this is the 99, what is that, 60? 9960XE? 3.1, 4.5 gigahertz, same, 1632. This one would probably be the one, but even that, $1,600 is... It seems a, I mean, I mean that's, man, I mean that's a lot. Um, so these are the new high-end CPUs, and so this is, this is all saying four-channel, you know, four-channel DDR4 2666, four-channel DDR4 2666, four-channel DDR4. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> Four channel and this is a little unusual because the xeon counterparts are six channel so if we look at the really high-end motherboards um from intel i don't know if there's any pictures here uh anantech had a really great article we'll go look at anantech because anantech needs the traffic uh yeah okay so Anantech, yeah, good job, Ian, good. Uh, Core i9, 15% better efficiency. There's all kinds of stuff here. Uh, 44 PCI Express lanes, uh, even for the 816 core, so that's good. 28 cores for the 7820 and the 7800. Remember, this is this is what's out now, so this is like for comparison. So 44 lanes across the board. 16 megs of L3, 1922, up to 24.75. Wow, that's a lot of cash. But look, the top frequency, 4.5 gigahertz across the board. So this is telling us that this is more of a thermal issue, really, uh, than anything. Although, I, you know, there's not, it's not, it doesn't say that it's four channel here. Um, no more. <laughs> well, that's good. Competition is alive and well. Uh, and this is good, asking the right questions. How did Intel gain 15% efficiency? <laughs> Design? Solder? <laughs> yeah, a little solder goes a long way. What's a, what's a, what's a little solder between friends? Uh, so, uh, 14 nanometer plus plus. So they've, they've, they've improved things a little bit in terms of like the process. We've got some ridiculous motherboards here. Okay, so these are 8 channel. Oh, that's X299 though. Uh... Yeah, uh, there's uh, Ian had a bunch of uh, a bunch of photos that were like the Xeon the six core Xeon motherboards that just looked utterly ridiculous. And those motherboards were just completely completely nuts. So yeah, like here's one. Yeah, so this is this is one of Ian's photos, and so this is the Xeon socket basically, and so this is six channels per side so it's really three on this side three on this side and then you know dual dual sticks of memory per channel um and those that's like the 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 higher end uh xeon socket and so that's why it's like the intel press release says four sockets or four channel memory so uh it's a press event 
We don't know. We don't know anything until it actually launches. I mean, Intel is, is still saying what they said at Computex, which is this thing's going to be out by the end of the year. I'm really excited for that. I mean, I'm, I'm really glad that the high, the 18 core part, honestly, is less than $2,000. That's actually a little bit surprising. It's really expensive, but for people that could use that, maybe that's not super expensive. I mean, we've got the $1,700 2990 32 core, which is honestly surprisingly fast for compiling it. The workloads that can take advantage of it, but you know, in terms of like mainstream computing and gaming and stuff like that, the eight core is where we should be. If you're building a system with something like this, the eight core, I mean, you could, you could maybe get by with the six core, but I think the eight core is going to be where it's at. So thank you, Maxim. He said, he said, bless you. Cause I sneezed. So Maxim was like, bless you. It's fine. Perkindo is a dollar with no, no comment. So cool. There's like 750 of you watching and not a lot of chat. So I think this is, uh, I think this is, uh, uh, we're going to end it soon. So it's like, is this good with Linux? Yes, actually, you know, Linux actually should be better with this hardware refresh and even like the higher end desktop refresh than most other new hardware. And the reason for that is there's not really a lot that's new here in terms of microarchitecture or really much of anything. We're going from six to eight cores on Coffee Lake. Not really a lot's changed there. The chipset here hasn't really changed much. The the drivers and stuff, we sort of worked all those out for the USB, the Intel USB 3.1 Gen 2. Intel is entering the fray with their USB 3.1 Gen 2 controllers. They did that previously on the H chipset to, you know, cut their teeth and make sure that, because the, the Z series, like if, if I get it wrong for the enthusiastic gamers, that's when everybody's going to like re out and grab their torches and pitchforks and that kind of thing. So they got that right on the H series, the lower cost chipsets, the mainstream business desktop chipsets. Saved a little money, and now they've rolled those lessons learned into the Z390 chipset. At least my own personal opinion. So, um, in terms of, uh, are we going to have any problems with Linux? I really doubt it, in all honesty, because there's not a lot changing. And on the high-end desktop side of things, those processors are basically tweaked Xeon processors. And so, again, not really anything new for Linux, new that Linux has to deal with. IOMMU groups and full reviews always, of course, yes. Uh, memory bandwidth. So these, these, these new boards do support insanely fast memory. And part of that, and part of the reason I think that they went with hyper-threading, we talked a little bit earlier in the program that I think that they're running up against bandwidth limitations. Like this actually could be more than dual channel. But if you've got ridiculously fast DDR4, maybe that's going to be less of an issue. So I've got some DDR4 4000, and when I get an i9 CPU, or maybe the, maybe the i7 8 core 8 thread CPU, we'll do the tests, and we'll do the tests at 4 gigahertz versus 2666, and see how it stacks up. Historically, Intel CPUs haven't really benefited from dramatically faster memory, but I'm going to predict, again, with no inside knowledge, this is just a guess, but I'm going to predict that the new CPUs are going to take better advantage of faster memory than previous generation CPUs have. Just a guess, but I think that's going to turn out to be true because it turns out that when you've got eight cores that are as fast as they are, it is going to take a lot of other horsepower to keep those, those cores fed. It's an exciting time to be alive. <laughs> There's really competition in the market, which is, which is fun. The prices on this... Uh, the, the prices on the, the 1151 stuff, like the desktop stuff like this, uh, are a little higher than I would have expected, in all honesty. But 8 cores, I mean, Intel, uh, Intel must be confident in their product, let's say, because there's never been more competition than there has been now. And so it's a bold strategy to come out with the pricing that they are for these parts, and to a certain, to a, to a lesser extent, I think, with the higher end desktop parts. Um, so it's gonna be interesting to see how that shapes up the next few months. Um, the general availability of the 1151 CPUs, the 16, the eight core, eight thread, eight, the, the CPUs that we talked about earlier for 1151 for these motherboards uh, should be toward the end of October. But, you know, a lot of analysts have said that there may be supply and capacity problems. I don't know, I'm gonna pre-order it. We'll see what happens. 
I pre-ordered this on launch day, didn't come until Friday. So I was like a week and a half, what, a week and a half, two weeks late, something like that. So we'll see how that works out in terms of general CPU availability. Do you think a Quantia is eating Intel on cheap 10 gig NICs? A Quantia is doing an amazing job with cheap 10 gig NICs. It's really honestly super impressive. This, uh, yeah, these are two Intel NICs. I think I saw in ASRock's line that they have some boards for this that have the two and a half gig NICs, which are the, uh, the, the sort of more, mod it's like toward the 10 gig standard, but they're two and a half gig, um, which is pretty cool, honestly. But I, I haven't, I don't, I don't have one of those yet, but I'm gonna try to do that. So, super exciting. Anybody have any other questions before I go? Pretty exciting. You have 30 seconds or maybe 45. Is deep learning testing still on the radar? I've already been deep learning testing with this guy. Deep learning, I'll, I, I'll give a spoiler. Even though that's like a $1,300 card or whatever it is, if you're into machine learning and you're doing a little bit of work with like TensorFlow and stuff like that, that actually turns out not to be a terrible price, especially compared with like the Titan V. So if you're doing something other than gaming, the price is not actually bad for machine learning type applications, which is, I mean, honestly, the, my own personal opinion of the Titan V is that it wasn't bad, a bad deal for machine learning and research scientists either. I didn't get my hands on one long enough to like do a review or anything because reasons, but um, it's honestly not a terrible value for the kinds of things that it enables. You shouldn't buy one to just fart around with or game or anything like that. And I don't think that, like, if you want, like, the most ridiculous 4K gaming ever, uh, you'd probably be better off to wait for a second-gen product. But if you want to get your feet wet now and do the machine learning aspect of it and enjoy ridiculous frame rates of 4K, uh, it's, not, it's not actually a terrible price. <laughs> Nick were drunken news? Uh, probably, maybe before the end of the year. I don't know. We'll see. Level 1 news is tonight. Be sure to check out our ECC versus non-ECC video that we did yesterday. And thank you guys. Everybody keep on keeping on live stream. We'll post this up later so you can watch it more of it later and that sort of thing. But that's it for me. Over and out. Thank you again. And if nothing else, join our Patreon because, hey, your money is the fuel that keeps us going. All right. Thanks. See ya.